Hello and welcome to the Demolishing History podcast for the city.ie. My name is Rebecca Daly and today we're going to look into those historic sites in Dublin that have been lost forever. We'll also be looking into what this does for our heritage and culture and what we the people can do to save them. On September 29th, an Edwardian house at Herbert Park became the last of three to be demolished to make way for luxury apartments and an apart hotel. Early that morning, an image of the rubble was spread throughout Twitter as many realised the horror of what had taken place overnight. The house once belonged to Michael O'Rahilly, or The O'Rahilly as he was also known as, who was an Irish Republican and nationalist. The O'Rahilly lived there with his wife Nancy and their children until his death in 1916 during the Easter Rising. A note left to his wife said, Written after I was shot. Darling Nancy, I was shot leading a rush up Moore Street and took refuge in a doorway. While I was there, I heard men pointing out where I was and made a bolt for the laneway I am in now. I got more than one bullet, I think. Tons and tons of love, dearie, to you and the boys and to Nell and Anna. It was a good fight, anyhow. Please deliver this to Nanny O'Rahilly, 40 Herbert Park, Dublin. Goodbye, darling. Nancy was a member of Cumann Amon and their home became a hub for important meetings. Even departments of Dáil Éireann and the IRA would meet there in the years after 1916. The house held countless memories of important moments in our history, yet it all ceased to exist overnight. I spoke with Daniel Cating, a councillor from the area who described it as a sad day for Dublin to see the house go. Joining me now via video call is Sinn Féin councillor for South East Inner City, Daniel Cating. So thank you so much, Daniel, first of all, for taking my call. Um, my first question to you is, what were your thoughts on the destruction of the Arahley House? Oh, no worries. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Well, to be honest, it was a very, it was very uh, disappointing and very disheartening um, that day. I remember, you know, we were, I was, well, I was in, I was in work and, and one of the, one of the guys who lives locally, um, was 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 alerted to the fact and I was sent on the pictures of of just the the rubble um so it was it was very disappointing considering we we had agreed as a council to protect the structure um you know efforts had begun um in April I suppose um was when we had first put down the motion to have it as a protective structure so it it, it was a process that had been ongoing for a number of months um, and then just to kind of find out that the developer had just knocked it without, you know, there was still the, the window for the judicial review was still open. Um, and, well, they, they weren't waiting for that to finish. Uh, and what their, what their kind of planning consultants have said is that, well, it, it's, it's the risk that they're allowed to take on. So it's a problem with the planning process itself as well that allows them to do that. So it's a, it's, it was kind of a, it was a lesson in the, in the planning process and how it is very much, you know, sided towards towards well the strategic housing development process, which is very much sided towards developers uh, and undermines local authorities. So even when we vote to protect things, uh, they can go over our heads anyway. So obviously, as you said, the window was still open, and they went ahead and they knocked it down. So is there no kind of repercussions for that, or is it just kind of something that is technically allowed to happen? Yeah, because it, because of the process of listing it as a protected structure had not finished um they well they were granted permission kind of halfway through that process so they because of that and because the dublin city council planning department um actually recommended the demolition despite knowing the councillors were on the other side of the argument they they kind of they have the leg to stand on to say well they had been given the permission and the council it's a council planning department had given the the go ahead uh, and they'd also received the the commencement notice was validated for the demolition by Dublin City Council. Um, so the the kind of the council organs of the council went ahead because by by law they had to by the the strategic housing development process they had an input into it. Their mandate from the minister, who's really their boss as opposed to the councillors, is build houses, um, but not public houses facilitate developers to build houses and um, so that, that's that was the kind of mandate they followed as opposed to the mandate that we had given them what would you have liked to seen happen with the with the house well i suppose the first point is the house is being knocked uh, kind of to make way for the driveway it's not they said it wasn't essential to knock the house to build what they're planning to build there and uh, it was the other two houses that were knocked previously is where the actual development is going so there are a number of ways it could have been incorporated into the, the final design 
Um, ideally, we would have liked to have seen uh, something of a visitor center there, um, a way to kind of diversify access to history um, and to give a local kind of access to history in that part of Dublin, which is which is sorely lacking, really. Um, and then there's also there are a number of other period houses that are protected. Um, these ones are even more historic. Uh, they were connected with the international fair that happened in the early 1900s. Two, over, over two and a half million people came to see Herbert Park and these houses that were built and the fair that went on there. So it was a huge kind of historical event and it was celebrating Irish industry. And I suppose that history has just now had to make way for luxury studio apartments, which is uh, very disappointing. In early October, then, there was a call for the house to be rebuilt after it had been knocked down. What did you think of that? Were you in favour of it? Yeah, together with a few members of the Green Party uh, on Dublin City Council, the Sinn Féin and the Green Party groups put forward a motion because we, well, the two groups had supported the protection of the house. So we, we, we called on rebuilding it along with them. There were a number of Fianna Fáil councillors as well who were proposing a similar motion. So there was very wide consensus on this issue on, on the council. We, want, we wanted the building protected, now we want it rebuilt. Uh, and that's it's it's almost unanimous, I would say. Where is it now? Then is there um, plans for it to be rebuilt, or what what's ha- what's happened with it since? Yeah, so the planning department um, have well, they've, they've they've been given the direction by the council to 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 go ahead to seek that the building be rebuilt. They're not sure if there is a legal mechanism for that, so that's something that they're exploring. Um, but meanwhile, there are two other kind of there are two other legal challenges going against this. Uh, one initiated by the council because uh, it's well, the council believes that false or misleading information was given to get the approval for, to demolish it. Not so much the permission, but to be allowed to conduct the works and to demolish it. And then the Pembroke Road Association uh, it has was get recently approved uh, for judicial a judicial review on the planning permission, which uh, would would seek to strike down the planning permission, uh, and the effect of that would be hopefully that the house would be rebuilt if they're successful in that. Just lastly on that, what do you think tearing down buildings like this, you know, with this kind of really interesting history behind them, what do you think that does for our heritage and our culture as Irish people? But I think I just I think it's um it's I suppose it's almost fitting for what Dublin uh, or what people are seeking to make Dublin into. Um well it's it's not the first historical site and it won't be the last historical site to be demolished to uh, to make way for luxury apartments and very expensive apartments. The people from the area, uh, even areas as affluent as Herbert Park, it's extremely unaffordable um, for the vast, vast majority of people who live uh, in this country. So there's, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's emblematic, emblematic of uh, a specific agenda that has dominated the, the housing agenda for the last number of years, that's dominated the planning process for the last number of years. Uh, the reforms to the planning process over the last number of years have favoured developers uh, over over locals. Um, I think it's, that's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, there have been a few recent cases where very inappropriate developments have been overturned. Um, but when it comes to the demolishing of historical sites, the kind of the view that seems to dominate is well, once the site's demolished, there's not really a huge amount that can be done. Um, although a number of years ago, Arches Garage on near Moore Street was was rebuilt after it was illegally demolished, but it was on, I believe, was on the record of protected structures. So, as it's it's as I said, it's just a, a fitting kind of metaphor for the way that Dublin is heading, um, and obviously, I believe it's the wrong direction. Unfortunately, as Daniel said, the destruction of the O'Rahilly House is not the first of its kind and it certainly won't be the last. On the party's website, Sinn Féin TD Angus Osnodig described the demolition of the house at 40 Herbert Park as a wanton act of cultural vandalism. This particular description really interested me and it made me think of another development that some have also classed as being an act of reckless cultural vandalism. The destruction of Viking Dublin in the 1970s and early 80s ignited immense public anger. In 1978, the streets of Dublin City were lined with protesters demanding a stop to the development of the Dublin Corporation Civic Offices, which of course is now the Dublin City Council Offices on Wood Quay. It was led by the late father F.X. Martin and then future President of Ireland Mary Robinson was among those protesting. In a speech to the crowd she said, 
We are marching for two purposes today, and please let us remember both purposes. We are marching to stop the destruction of Wood Key, and we are marching for the construction of civic offices to be constructed elsewhere. Tragically, the countless efforts of FX Martin, Mary Robinson, and all of those involved in the Friends of Medieval Dublin march were ignored by the authorities, who pressed on with the development anyway. The power of the people could not prevail back in the 1970s, and as a result, we have lost a huge part of history simply so offices could be built. However, one student from Trinity College Dublin has started a campaign to try and prevent yet another piece of our history from being changed forever. So I'm here on video call with Koch Murphy, who set up a petition on change.org to save James Joyce's House of the Dead on Usher's Island from becoming a tourist hostel. So thanks so much for joining me. Um, First of all, can you just tell me a little bit about the house on 15 Usher's Island itself, please? So 15 Usher's Island is a Georgian house, four story Georgian house. Um, currently it is in a bit of a state there's weeds growing um, around the facade um, but it, it, there were attempts serious attempts made to refurbish the place um, by a man called Brendan Kilty who was a barrister who bought the house a number of years ago um, but he went bankrupt unfortunately in 2017 and he really tried to revitalise the place he had uh, special gatherings um, to celebrate the, the story of the dead um, he completely um, just sort of uh, refurbished the whole ground floor and really kept it um, in a period design. So kept the furnishings. Um, currently, the, the staircase, the banisters, they're all the same as they were at the turn of the century when Joyce would have been visiting his great aunts who rented the uh, premises um, and had their own music school there. So in the dead, the fictionalized Morkin sisters have their own music school and the protagonist of the story, um, Gabriel Conroy, and his wife, um, Greta, attend this this party. And um, it takes place, the story takes place mostly in the house, but then it moves um, through the city back to the centre, to, to the Gresham Hotel. And then finally, in the last few pages, we move out um, of Dublin and to Galway and to all over Ireland. So um the house is just so particularly important um, in Joyce's work um, as one of the few places that are nearly completely intact since the time that Joyce would have been in the house. Um, so a lot of the, the film The Dead by John Houston was filmed here um, and that's a very important film in Irish cinema as well as in, in Houston's own filmography. Um, but with you know the Martello Tower in Sandy Cove, um, other places like Swanee's Chemist uh, on Lincoln Place. These are sites that are still here that were in Joyce's works. Um, fortunately for Swanee's, it's maintained and it has been given um, money, uh, a grant from the T.S. Eliot estate. Um, and the Martello Tower is, is open to visitors as well. Um, those two sites are important in, in Ulysses. But with this house, it's unfortunately closed. So um, my petition really aims to, to open up this, this space um, for people who love the story to open it up for the people rather than just a select few um, who would be staying there overnight um, so I, I just that, that's just one passion of mine um, to, to keep this place open for, for myself and everyone um, just to, to celebrate the story yeah absolutely it's a wonderful passion to have <laughs> um, and so as you mentioned there you set up the, the pet- petition so how is that doing? What, um, how many people have signed it so far? So um, I was completely just overwhelmed by the, like the trajectory of the signatures that went up. So on the second day, it was at 700. Then it went up to 1,000, 2,000. And then currently, it's over 3,000, so, um, which is great. And it wouldn't have gotten so far without the support of John McCourt, who was a, a prominent scholar in Joyce Studies. Um, his support on Twitter was just monumental to this whole thing. Um, so since then, it has achieved the support of Fintan O'Toole, um, uh, Lenny Abramson, Reed Smith, TD, um, and others, which is just, uh, I, I can't believe it. Um, these are people who I've only like written about in essays and, uh, you know, had chats with my friends about, but these are people who are getting involved with the petition, which is just great. Um, and of course, all the people from all over the world who have sent lovely comments of support um, showing that the, the house really has a fan base and a bit of a cult going for it. So there, there is some hope for the place, even though 
um, planning permission has been granted to the house, unfortunately, um, by Dublin City Council. And the 5th of November is the uh, deadline for appeals to be sent to uh, them. So um, this petition will hopefully go through tomorrow. I'll be getting the, the all the signatures together and sending them off with um, other objections. So why do you think, um, probably generally, buildings of like this, why do you think that they're important and why do you think they should be maintained? Um, it's it's a very complex question, I guess. Um, I think architecturally, of course, there there is an important case there to, to keep these places in a sort of time capsule um, state um, as kind of an opposite opposition to the the new buildings that are being built across Dublin um, to just leave some space for these old buildings and it is a listed property so there is you know a legal um, element there to keep this this place intact to some degree um, but the hostel would unfortunately destroy what's inside so of course to, to make room for 56 beds you'd have to change the interior and um, the facade would likely stay the same um but i think just to keep some of these places would be great um because you know ireland has a, a rich history and um, of course you know colonialism is involved in the the building of these these houses and um, they're georgian houses there's a reason they're called georgian houses and um, but it, it would be nice not to forget about um those buildings that people lived in and people loved um yeah, definitely. Um, just as you mentioned there about, you know, kind of our culture and our heritage, what impact does destroying a building like this have on that? Mm, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. I, I guess um, a building has, has more meaning if it's associated with a person or like a, a piece of literature that people love. So like with the O'Reilly House, there was, there was a person attached to that, to that house who contributed to our history, to our in, independence movement. Um, so to see that house demolished in real time was uh, like disgusting. It was to see, I, I, especially during a pandemic when you couldn't go there to, to protest necessarily or to, to be there on the scene, to see it on, on the internet, um, it, was, it was just a surreal thing. Um, but I, I think it, especially if a building is attached to a person, there is like a, an aura around that, that premises. Um, yeah, I, I, and as well, Dublin is a city of literature, um, according to UNESCO. So I think um, to keep those buildings is very important because I, I don't think the city would have that honour uh, other than for those those spaces that are referenced in literature. At the end of Koch's petition, she writes, As students, teachers, readers and writers, we demand that further action be taken to the loss of this house to individual gain and to structural damage. This house belongs to the readers, to the city and to the Dubliners who form the hearts of Joyce's work. This is a call for interest, not further apathy, from the government, Dublin City Council and other influential organisations. And very well said by Koch there. So time and time again, public scrutiny of the destruction of historic and culturally rich sites is ignored. Instead, these buildings are replaced with luxury housing, office buildings or indeed a tourist hostel. Perhaps maintaining such historic locations would actually encourage the same volume of tourists that they aim to attract with these new developments. However, sadly, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for listening. My name is Rebecca Daly and this has been a podcast for the city.ie. Take care.